Thank you very much for the very kind introduction. I'm very happy to be here. I think it's um, it's a, a very good moment to be here in, in Dublin and speaking about uh, uh, the eurozone, the crisis, and uh, and the way we have um, started to come out of it. And I don't want to be too definitive that in saying that the crisis is over, but we still we already have good results to show for our efforts over the past uh, three years. Uh, and I think it's appropriate to be here uh, a few months, two, three months after Ireland successfully exits its bailout, uh, and at a time where we are also two, three months away from exiting successfully our own bailout. So I think um, this is something we should discuss here today. Um, the challenges that we had three, four, five years ago, and the way I think uh, we have um, turned the corner, in some cases exceeded expectations, uh, and let's try not to forget uh, what um, the critics of, uh, of the EU strategy on the crisis were saying even a year, two years ago, uh, back in the, at the time when um, the Eurozone collapse was being announced for uh, a few days later. I remember reading some columns on this in the Financial Times. So it's good that politicians are scrutinized and uh, held responsible for their decisions, but it's also good that everyone in the public debate is held responsible for uh, the opinions that, that they held. And I think, in some fundamental sense, we have um, shown that we're taking the right course. Of course, there's room for adjustment, and in some cases, significant adjustment, and there were certainly wrong decisions taken along the way. But this is an appropriate moment when, when Ireland and Portugal have um, reached the, the end of their, of their programs, um, and there is no question that Portugal will exit the bailout successfully. Um, it's a good time to, to remember uh, what I think has, has already been achieved, even though some significant challenges remain, and we'll talk about those. Uh, I'll talk about some of the issues related to, to, the, um, to the crisis and to the uh, efforts that were developed at the European and national level to overcome the crisis. But I wanted to start with the idea that, um, that we need uh, to develop a strategy for Europe, and that perhaps Portugal and Ireland have a fundamental contribution to make in this respect, uh, because they are, as they say, peripheral countries. But I want to talk about the idea that the periphery is more of an opportunity than a threat, uh, and try to actually redefine a little bit the concept of periphery, and think about how Portugal and Ireland are in some respects in a privileged position to think about the future of the Eurozone. Uh, you, you may want to, th to remember that those who are at the periphery have a view of the whole, and those who are at the center have to turn around to see different parts of the whole. And I think this is a, a little lesson in, in applied geometry, uh, but, uh, but I think it, it, it actually has a deeper meaning, um, that perhaps the center is, is sometimes a bit self-centered, as the word itself indicates, and that the periphery can have a more cosmopolitan approach to uh, EU policy, and I'll try to develop this a little bit, uh, a cos cosmopolitan theory of, of the EU, so to speak. Uh, we've been reminded of, of these issues uh, with, the, with the situation in the Ukraine. Um, tragic for, for all Europeans in the sense that we've been made aware of, uh, on the one hand, how powerful European soft power is, how capable of attracting people in different parts of the world, how capable of building networks and connections with different parts of the world. But at the same time, and in some respects, um, fragile, because it is built on consensus, because there are no state structures at the European level, uh, and because um, outcomes are never fully determined. And there's a, an element of crisis that seems to be um, in some respects, always present in the way we do European politics. Uh, I want to, to point out uh, what this soft power means and how to make it um, an asset even more than it is now. And what it means, in my opinion, is the ability that European society has to directly, without the aid or interference of state structures, to establish connections all over the world. Uh, and these connections can be built on a certain way of life, they can be built on uh, European NGOs, 
They can be built on the fact that we have in the EU 28 different member states that can sometimes have a very interesting division of labor. Some of them will be closer to some parts of the world, others will be closer to other parts of the world. This is an enormous asset that the EU has. Uh, but let's remember what, what this asset is based on, and it's essentially based on diversity. Uh, what is at the root of European soft power? The fact that in the EU we have 28 different nationalities uh, that don't aspire to become one. Uh, what they aspire to is to create a space where they can freely communicate among themselves. Uh, this capital of diversity, uh, of exchange of ideas, this very intense practice and training in, in, in diversity and in a cosmopolitan outlook, which perhaps we, most of us in this room, didn't have when we were growing up, but that certainly people of a younger generation will have. Uh, people who grow up in the EU as it exists now will, from a very early age, be trained in looking at, at life from different perspectives, having friends from many different countries, trying to combine all these perspectives. This is an enormous asset, and let's have no doubt that this is actually what is at the root of European soft power. Because this intense training in diversity and in a cosmopolitan outlook will then be applied to the rest of the world. Someone who was brought up in uh, knowing different cultures from an early age will then be much in a much better position to know different cultures outside Europe as well. So it, it is an enormous asset. But let's, um, let's try to remember that uh, what, is, what is being attempted in Europe is to create a free communication space between different cultures and different nationalities, and not to bring them together under one single way of life and way of thinking. This is crucial. And we have here two opposite goals. On the one hand, we want to create a, a free space of communication, and this involves integration. On the other hand, we don't want this integration to mean more homogeneity. We don't want it to mean replacing 28 different ways of looking at the world with one single way of looking at the world. And in some cases, these 28 are actually at the regional level also very diverse, and, and that diversity should be stimulated. Let me speak a little bit about what, what it means to create this, um, this free space of communication and how um, you actually have to rely on, um, on, on, a, on a kind of deep integration in order to create it. And let's take the example of the banking union, which is, of course, very important in, um, in Europe right now and of particular significance for Ireland and its, um, and its uh, exit from the crisis, uh, a priority as well for Portugal to build a fully functional banking union in Europe. Uh, what are we trying to do with the banking union? To create uh, integrated financial markets in Europe. Uh, to create a single European financial market. And let's not think this is about uh, money. Uh, in a way, it is about money, but it's a lot more than money. Because financial markets are really machines, about, machines that predict the future and that, in some sense, actually determine that future. What financial markets do is to look around uh, and think about what the, future, what, what the future world should look like. What goods should be produced? What companies should be supported? What companies should no longer be supported? So financial markets are always predicting the future and helping shape that future. So it's um, of fundamental importance that you have fully functioning financial markets. It's, it's, it's not about uh, mere money. Um, what, what, do we have, what do we have in Europe? Um, uh, we thought, uh, and I think, um, quite wrongly, and it surprises me a bit that back in 1995, this was not clear to, to all people or to most people. We thought that having um, capital movement, free capital movement, um, and a single currency was enough to create uh, fully integrated financial markets. Uh, and that was clearly not the case. It looked to be the case under conditions of credit expansion in the first few years of the euro, where every difference was somehow disguised but once we hit the, the first bumps on the road, uh, financial markets immediately started to fragment <coughs> along national lines. Uh, and that was the moment when we had to make a crucial decision. Um, were we going to watch passively this fragmentation, which was, was starting in financial markets, but would quickly move to politics uh, and would quickly have effects on 
the other three freedoms uh, of movement uh, of people, of, of goods and services. In fact, I think in 2011, 2012, we're at a point where you could start to see the stresses in the single market itself. Uh, you could start to see companies retreating from other EU markets and, uh, because of financial uncertainty. So were we going to do that? Or were we going to uh, step back, look at what was not working, and revise the model of integration in Europe? And to all the critics, it is important to point out that um, the EU and EU institutions were able to take this step back and, and actually look at European institutions with a, with a critical eye and realize what was wrong. Very difficult always for politicians to admit past mistakes. And what happened in Europe in the past two years was in fact that everyone on a whole collectively was able to admit that the Eurozone was built on very shaky and imperfect foundations and start the process by which those were revised and perfected. It's not, not, not a small achievement to be able to, to have that, um, that, uh, that exercise of, of self-criticism. Uh, it's also uh, a good example, the banking union, of how this space of free communication, communication of capital, communication of goods, communication of services, communication of people, communication of ideas, and even communication of politics, as, as we'll see later on, uh, that this, this free space of communication doesn't happen on its own. It's not enough to have free movement of capital uh, in order to have fully integrated financial markets. You actually need EU institutions. Um, you need uh, banking supervision at the European level. You need um, banking resolution rules and a banking resolution fund at the European level. So let's not make the mistake of thinking that a space of communication in Europe, uh, a truly European civil society where there's free movement of ideas, of goods, of people, of capital, can be built simply on um, abolishing barriers. It's not enough to abolish barriers. It's necessary to create the institutions that avoid fragmentation and that keep uh, this free space of communication together. And in the case of financial markets, these are the institutions of the banking union. Uh, the situation we had, uh, and we still have in, uh, to a considerable extent, uh, but being corrected, is a situation where financial markets exist, uh, uh, are, are separated, fragmented along national borders. Um, this is incompatible with having a uh, a single uh, a single currency uh, because what it, what does it mean to have a single currency? It means that you have a single monetary policy and a single monetary policy since monetary policy is transmitted through the financial system requires um, by definition in fact requires an integrated financial system otherwise you're going to have a situation which you had um, uh, and in some respects you still have let's be honest about that a situation where uh, decisions by the European Central Bank are being transmitted in very different ways to different countries and different regions because they are being channeled through separate financial systems. Financial systems that have their own conditions separate from, from financial systems in other countries and in other regions. Uh, it's very clear, and I think it was clear to everyone, to every policymaker and to every analyst uh, about uh, in April 2012, I think this was when we had a common realization that the banking union was, um, was inevitable, necessary, and desirable. Uh, you had a situation which I, I remember uh, Christian Noyer, the, the Bank of France governor, defending, I believe, here in, in, uh, uh, in your think tank uh, in 2012. Um, you had a situation where, let's say, two hotels uh, on separate sides of the border, and Noyer gave this example many times, so you may have heard it before, Two hotels on separate sides of the French-Italian border had the exact same business model, uh, the same tourists uh, staying there, uh, the same landscape, and they were paying, uh, they were paying significantly different interest rates for uh, their loans, because one was located in Italy, the other was located in France. Um, what follows from this? Well, it follows that uh, one, one of those hotels is going to be able to uh, 
uh, lower prices for its rooms uh, because it has to pay less in terms of, uh, of what it pays for its loans, or that it will be able to invest in better facilities. Um, this uh, unfair competition, which is not based on anything having to do with the business model of the firms themselves, was of course going to be incompatible with having a single market. And you had to try to address this by making sure that financial markets are fully integrated and that you only have one single financial market in Europe and that you try to approach a situation where this is, where this is the case. Uh, I think in some respects, it has been said by, by Mario Draghi, um, the current president of, of the ECB, that this is the greatest achievement since uh, the single currency. In some respects, I think it is even a bigger achievement. Uh, why? Because um, these close connections between national political systems and national financial systems are a given of, of European political history. Um, this goes back to the Medici in Florence in the late 14th century. Banks and states grew together in Europe. They supported each other. They have a common history. You cannot tell the, the history of, of European states without telling the history of, of European banks. Uh, sometimes the influence went from banks to states, other times the other way around, but they've always been uh, very closely connected, much more than in the United States, for example. So the banking union, in the way it breaks this connection, or at least it makes it much weaker, is a break with European history of, of really enormous proportions. And let's not, um, let's not forget that. Uh, and let's not forget the, uh, the political and social dimension that this has, that perhaps the banking union will also help us have um, societies that where the links between states and banks are weaker. Um, and that is also a valuable achievement for democracy itself, in my opinion, uh, if you have a, a society where links between states and banks are weaker. Uh, so lots of things are, are, are changing as a result of the banking union. Um, but the most fundamental change is that when it comes to financial markets, we are on our way to, to having uh, a, a free space of communication, fully integrated financial markets. And this um, is, is, is going to be the first time that we have it. Because we didn't have it with free movement, we didn't have it with a single currency. Um, fully integrated financial markets are based on, on, on three different uh, legs, so to speak, free movement of capital, single currency, and uh, and supervision, banking union supervision and, and resolution um, at the European level. Uh, so I, I I do think this is a this is a significant achievement. Let me now turn to the other big discussion in Europe, uh, which was was being developed at the same time as the discussion on banking union and. Perhaps now that the discussion on banking union is receding into the background, this other discussion will take center stage. And this is the discussion about a fiscal union. Uh, what is a fiscal union? A fiscal union is um, the attempt or the idea of creating a, a structure of revenue and expenditure that is common collective at the European level. Uh, that at the limit, uh, revenue, public revenue and public expenditure will be mutualized, will be common, will be shared by member states. This is the idea. Uh, fiscal revenue and fiscal expenditure will become common. Um, you could have a slow movement in this direction. You could at first mutualize uh, some, uh, some elements on the revenue side. You could mutualize, for example, credit, debt, and not mutualize taxes. But credit and debt are both a part of the, of the revenue and a part of the expenditure when you pay interest. So you could just mutualize the debt part. This would be a fiscal union. Uh, of course, it would only extend to part of the, of the uh, total expenditure and revenue list, but it would be a fiscal union. You could mutualize other parts of the budget, you could mutualize, for example, expenditure on education. Uh, you could mutualize expenditure on unemployment benefits. Um, you could mutualize limited parts of uh, the national budget uh, and leave the rest to member states. 
But in, in the crucial aspect, every attempt of this sort would already constitute a fiscal union. Uh, because the crucial change from a situation where you have now, where you have national budgets, and the European budget is dependent on national budgets, budgets and gets its revenue from national budgets, would be left behind and would be moving to a situation where revenue and expenditure would be mutualized. Uh, what is the main consideration here? You may probably guess by now that that uh, uh, mental framework that I started with, more integration to create a free space of communication, um, but not take that integration to the level where rather than having a free space of communication, you have a new state replacing the national states. So you have to be in the middle where there's integration to create a free space of communication, but there's no integration to create a new state replacing the national states. And it seems to me that the fiscal union, as opposed to the banking union, takes it to, to a point where you are, in fact, uh, replacing national states with, with a European state. Um, and that is something I regard with, with reservations, of course, because as I started uh, explaining, uh, I think the great um, wealth of Europe is its diversity. Uh, the fact that you have all these nationalities and cultures communicating without borders, because this free space of communication doesn't have borders, but that you preserve differences. Uh, and where are these differences uh, recognized? Where can you find them? In essence, you find them in the national budgets. The national budgets are a reflection of different ways of looking at the world. Uh, I like to, 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 to remind, uh, I like to remember a, a famous quote by Schumpeter um, saying that the national budget is the soul of a country. Uh, and what he means by this, he, he even tried to develop, I think he was the only one who tried to develop such a discipline, uh, he even tried to develop uh, a, a discipline called fiscal sociology. And as far as I know, I haven't seen any other attempts to develop such a discipline. You start by looking at the national budget, then you develop the whole sociology based on it. You start from the national budget and you learn what the country is like, how it works, what are the different interest groups, what is the balance between different interest groups, what are the priorities that this country has. And I think Schumpeter had in mind something like, you know, I want to study Ireland, give me the national budget, and I'll write a book on Ireland and I don't need any other information. I don't need to walk outside on the streets. I don't need to talk to people. The budget is better than any other source of information. And this is taking it to an obvious extreme. Um, and when I say this, I'm not trying to say that the budget is uh, everything that matters. I'm just trying to call attention to how important it is and to the subtle differences between countries which are reflected in national budgets. Uh, if this is true, if Schumpeter's fiscal sociology is a good idea, even if we don't want to take it to the to the extremes that, uh, that Schumpeter had in mind. If, if this is a good idea, then we have to be careful about replacing national budgets with a single European budget. And you know that even during the last week, this, this idea was, was put forward um, by some influential voices, among them uh, the German finance minister, um, that one should have perhaps a, 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 a Eurozone budget, which will work in a different way from the EU budget and be based on fundamentally different principles, uh, and that you should have a EU budget commissioner with powers over national budgets. And these would be the first rudimentary steps towards the fiscal union. I'm not sure that it is necessary, and I'm not sure that it is desirable. Uh, because if we believe that differences manifest themselves at the level of the national budget, and that you need to leave room for these delicate, uh, very difficult choices, between interest groups, between different priorities. Uh, looking at the, pro at the budgetary process at the national level in Portugal and in Ireland, it's difficult. It's become a lot more difficult, I'm sure, during the crisis. But that's a good thing, because now, at least in Portugal, we have the level of scrutiny and discussion about the budget, which is much deeper, much more enlightened. Um, everyone is aware of the choices that are being made there. And I just hope that this level of scrutiny and public debate on the budget will remain even after the crisis, um, because if it had been there before the crisis, we wouldn't have had it. So looking at the budgetary process in, in member states, uh, you realize how this delicate process, this national conversation about its own future has to be preserved. 
Um, and that having someone in Brussels make decisions, fundamental decisions about, about budgetary choices is something that, when I try to imagine the future, seems to me difficult to make work. Um, the whole point of having uh, a commissioner in Brussels making decisions about national budgets would be for that commission to make the difficult decisions. Because the easy decisions, you can just coordinate. You don't need, you don't need to have someone in Brussels imposing a certain direction on national countries. And in fact, the German finance minister made it clear that this would be a form of discipline. Now, if having a, a EU commissioner in Brussels making important decisions and difficult decisions, decisions that are difficult to accept at, at the national level, one may perhaps expect that people would disagree with him, would disagree with these decisions. What is the point then of moving them to Brussels, to the commission? I suspect that the point is to make them a little more, a little easier to impose. They are difficult and we should move them to the EU, to the Commission, because from there, from that standpoint, they will be easier to impose. Well, do we want them to be easier to impose? Uh, do we want those decisions to be made by someone who can't quite e hear the protests outside the windows if the decision is really difficult? Someone who is um, a few thousand kilometers away and can't hear the protests. Um, is this a good idea? I don't want to give a definitive answer. Um, of course, um, we've had processes, the United States um, on top of, of every other, of um, uh, progressive, uh, the progressive development of a fiscal union. Um, and it took uh, more than a century for it to be fully developed. Uh, but then let's also think about what is being sacrificed, because the United States, for all its um, for all its wonders, and I lived in the United States for six years, uh, and know very well how, know very well also what American soft power means. But let's not forget that the, the United States is in the end a nationality. And that is a level of homogeneity, uh, which is sometimes overlooked. <laughs> People seem to think that the United States is an extremely diverse country. It's not my, it's not my impression, actually, that when you, when you get out at an airport in, uh, in, uh, in Dallas, get out of an airport uh, in Montana, Minnesota, that uh, things look roughly the same. Uh, the United States has a high level of homogeneity. Do we want to, to go in that direction? Do we want to have, uh, do we want Europe to be uh, a homogeneous place? Uh, do we want to have a single way of life for all of us? Or do we want our way of life to be precisely the combination of many ways of life? And the exercise, which is not always easy, of being forced to look at things from a different perspective, um, of being forced to look at things um, almost sometimes from the opposite perspective, which the European Union is, is, in my opinion, really about. It's an exercise in cosmopolitanism. It's an exercise in uh, getting out of our comfort zone, uh, getting out and uh, getting, getting away from what comes easier to us and forcing us to look at things from a different perspective. So to, to conclude, uh, let's, um, let's try to develop this free space of communication. There's still a lot to do. Uh, we've achieved considerable results when it comes to financial markets, and those are important for all sorts of reasons. They are important even at the level of ideas, because I don't know, uh, I, I think that uh, uh, very good ideas will sooner or later find their way into financial markets because they want to be put in practice. You have an idea, you have a dream about what to do, you want someone to give you money so that you can put it in practice. So financial markets are also about ideas. Uh, but we still have a lot to do. Um, we have to defend the free movement of people against its critics. Uh, we have to integrate uh, some markets uh, for goods and services that are not fully integrated, in particular energy, telecom, transport. And we have, of course, and this I will not be able to develop today, but it's also um, a topic for the future. We have to make sure that while preserving the distinctiveness of national policies and national politics, we have to make sure that there is also a free space of communication between politics and policy choices. That policy choices are able to communicate among themselves, to that we are able to learn more from what is being done at, at the policy level in other countries, that are uh, better coordinated, so that we, we also have an internal market in politics 
and not just in internal markets in goods, capital, services, uh, um, and even ideas. So there's a lot to do, but let's be clear about exactly what we're trying to do, and we're not trying to uh, replace um, the different European cultures and nationalities with an overarching European nationality, because there would be a lot to lose if, if we tried to do that. Thank you very much. Thank you.